What's up everyone, Steven here from TechMaker. This is building an NFT bookstore with React.js part two. In part one of this series, we went through the actual setup process. We installed some software and um, we added Truffle and we changed, um, we added a few things. We added Truffle and Ganache, uh, which is our local blockchain. And we changed this number here. Um, we connected an account over in our browser so that now this executes a transaction and we can see this value updates to the number we just changed it to. So whenever you set up a React app, and again, like there are very simple tutorials out there um, for learning React, they're like an hour long. If you have not ever looked at React, this might not be the best place to start, but I'm gonna try to make it beginner friendly, but just come into it knowing if you see anything a little bit complicated, just kind of stick with it for a little while because there's a lot more going on in this app um, than a typical just straight up React app when you set it up. So that being said, I thought this episode might be useful to kind of just walk through some of what's going on. And then in the next episode, start kind of setting up our actual user interface. So let's go back over to our code and let's just kind of look at what all we've got. So first of all, um, just in terms of directories, um, you've got a package JSON, which is typical in a React project that just lists out the dependencies and some scripts that we can use and so on. Um, we've also got, um, let's see, so we've got our source folder here and inside of source, um, we've got some stuff. We've got a service worker, which I haven't really looked at, so I'm not gonna get into what that is because I don't really know off the top of my head. Um, we've got an index.js, which is importing React. It's importing the React DOM. It's importing some style sheets here. Um, and then we're rendering this app component. Um, and then adding it to document get element by ID root. And um, that's basically what you typically see in React app. Um, the next thing we've got are some CSS here, which we won't really go through. Well, there's not much there in the first place. Um, then we've got get web three, um, which we'll circle back to later. Um, but essentially it's establishing a connection to Ethereum in here. Um, we got a test file, which is just kind of setting up, um, it's testing the setup. And I think, um, if we go back over to package JSON, so we have this test here. So we should be able to do npm run test if we go back over to our, actually let me just open up my terminal here, um, new terminal, and maybe we can do npm run test. And you can see that it's executing React scripts test there. Oh, not that, let's scroll up here. Um, press enter to trigger a test run. So I've not actually run this before exactly on this. Um, but it's basically saying, okay, our test one passed, so on. Um, I want to stop this. How do I do that? Maybe control C. Okay, cool. So anyway, so you can run the test. Um, and that's basically running this app.test.js, which is cool. Um, I need to research more about UI testing. I do testing a lot on smart contracts, but I don't really worry about it on the UI side so much. Um, anyway, so the meat and potatoes um, of this project is gonna be in app.js. And so that's where I wanna spend a little bit of time kind of uh, working through this and exactly what's going on. Um, one other thing too, uh, we have this contracts folder here and these are JSON files uh, which we obviously can't really even read. Um, but these, I think, are generated whenever we uh, potentially compile the project. Uh, don't quote me on that. Um, I need to research exactly at which point these are generated. But these represent JSON APIs so that Web3 can talk to our smart contracts um, which we did in like the first section of this series and we have not brought those in yet. So eventually we'll have like a, a bookstore.json in here, which is gonna allow us to talk to that bookstore smart contract. Um, okay, so let's get over into app, which is where, you know, if you've done any React tutorials or you work in React, 
Um, often the new project will be dramatically simpler than what we have here. Normally you're basically going to have some kind of simple component being returned here or simple uh, HTML just telling you, hey, React is successfully running. But there's obviously a lot more going on here. So at the bottom where we're rendering, this is all kind of basic stuff. We have our div class name app and we have some like simple HTML um, just printed out. And then it's telling us to try changing the value stored on line 42 in which file, which is this file, which we can look at that in a second. And then it's printing out the stored value is this.state.storage value. So let's go to the top and kind of work through this. So the first thing is we are setting a state object up here with storage value, web3, null, accounts null, and contract null. And then whenever the component mounts, so this gets fired asynchronously after, or it gets fired after the component loads essentially, or mounts to be more specific. And essentially what it's doing, first of all, we get our web three connection. So we can open that up and look through that. Um, but this is essentially boilerplate code um, to load MetaMask or, or some sort of uh, web three provider. So I have MetaMask installed. That's what we installed in the last thing. So we wait on get web three. And then what that does is it, it loads, once we like click that accept or whatever thing in our MetaMask, uh, it connects our accounts to it, which allows us to pull some information like the addresses that are in there and so on and so forth. It gets the network ID. So we're, con we're not connected to the Ethereum mainnet or one of the test nets. We're connected to this local host Ganache server that's running. So it pulls in that network ID. Um, we have run, um, well, I don't know if we manually ran it or if I guess the npm start runs it. Um, I need to look more into exactly what's doing it, but what's happening is at some point, this simple storage contract, which we can't see here, it's in the parent directory. We're down in this client directory. Um, so if you go up a level and look, you should see the actual simple storage contract. And then it's basically saying, give us the one that's on network with the network ID. And then it gets an instance of it. Um, so it's got uh, the deployed network, the address, and the ABI. Um, ABI is stands for, it's, it's kind of like API, but it's ABI, which is Application Binary Interface, which we don't need to get into at this moment. Um, but essentially what this is, is it's loading the API of the smart contract so that we can actually talk to it. So for example, if our smart contract, our bookstore has a publish function, for example, um, this is how we would expose uh, that function, if that makes sense. So essentially what we could call here, and this is weird to call this like instance. I mean, I understand why they're doing it, um, but what we could do is be like, in our case, we might have a bookstore. And then later on, you could say like, await bookstore.publish. And so basically having this instance of the contract and I may be, hopefully I'm not interpreting that wrong here. Um, we'll get more into it later. I've been really, really deep working in JavaScript tests on smart contracts. And so I'm looking at, I'm thinking about how I would do that there. It's a little bit different here, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. In any case, this is how we talk to the smart contract. And then we're setting the state. So basically um, we've got web three accounts and the instance of this contract. Um, and so you can see that here. So, you know, and another thing that's kind of funny is up here we have contract null and then down here, just in case you're not familiar with what's going on with the ES6, this is equivalent if these things match to saying web three colon web three. So it's like web three, web three accounts, accounts, and then contract instance. And the only reason they're specifying instance here is because those names don't match. Um, so anyway, that's why that looks different, which I find be a sort of weird choice, but whatever. Um, okay, so, and then there's a callback, this.run example. Okay, and so this is where we haven't looked at the contract for this thing, right? Um, but when it's telling us to, if we go back over to the 
page here. It says, try changing the value stored on line 42. Okay. So what's happening is we're pulling out the accounts and the contract from the state. We're saying contract methods, and then we're running one called set, and we're passing in the number 12 in this case. Um, so we could change that number, and we're sending it from accounts zero. So basically what this is doing, um, and so this function, or this call rather, this thing that we're awaiting, um, when we call send and we say from accounts zero, it's going to select the first account that this has access to that we've connected. So if we go back over here and we click on this MetaMask icon, um, got it, it's giving me some safety tips. So you can see here that I'm connected. And if I click on this, um, it's got a few, I have three and I have three connected accounts. Um, it's probably because I've been doing some testing in these other ones. Um, so, but anyway, it's picking the first out of the list, which I'm in account six right now, apparently. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, that's the reason for that is because when I added it, it gave me that as a default title. So it's the number six there isn't special. It's just because I have other testing accounts in here. But that's the first one connected on this page. And so what it's doing is it's saying, okay, take account zero and say that we're executing this transaction from that account. And that's why it prompts up for me to confirm because you cannot execute from the code on somebody else's behalf. Like you have to, I have to verify in MetaMask. That's really the purpose of MetaMask is for me to agree to the transaction because this, this function could cause me to send money to somebody else or something like that. And in reality, anything that changes state on the blockchain, which this does because it's setting something. Again, we haven't looked at the contract code here, but we can see this, that it's setting something. Anything that's not just looking up data on the chain, if it's actually changing something, it's gonna cost gas. So basically, um, you can see here that like we've got um, this method or this call that sets something, this is gonna prompt us to click a button that says accept, okay? And then once we accept, we have this contract methods get dot call, okay? And I assume that's basically giving us the number back. Um, so we can come in here and change this to like one, two, three, four, five, six. And if we save this and head over to our browser, it's gonna be prompting us to confirm. Um, and so you can see here, I, I had the thing open already, so let me let me reject that and try it again. Um, just to make sure that's clear. Um, so I refresh the page. It's saying, hey, confirm. And you can see that the value right now is zero, which is the default that we provide. And once I confirm this, and you can see I'm actually spending this much money in gas. Now it's actually coming from the fake money generated on my blockchain running on my computer. But on a real blockchain, on the on the live Ether, Ethereum blockchain, or on uh, mainnet rather, and or on Polygon or anywhere else, um, this would actually cost money and it's different amounts of money on the different networks, which is an important point But anyway, when we confirm that then it goes and checks and says, okay, now the value is one two three four five six Okay So that's basically what's going on. So we're running this example and then down here this is just basically um, Pulling out that storage value. Okay, so let's let's actually kind of play with this a little bit um, so what we can do is just copy all this again and let's set it to uh, 4321 and let's save that and then let's go run this again. Um, I can't declare the const response. I can say uh, let response and then I can come down here and just say response. Okay, so if I confirm it's gonna prompt me to confirm again. And now I've got four, three, two, one. So what if we actually set the state twice? Let's try that. Just kind of working through a little ridiculous example just so you see the flow of calls. So, okay, so we're gonna confirm. We update the screen to one, two, three, four, five, which is part of the cool thing about React. When the state changes, the screen changes. Okay, then we confirm again, four, three, two, one.
So again, we haven't actually looked through this specific smart contract, um, and that's fine. I don't really care to. It's probably just really simple, probably a get and a set method. We will do something similar, presumably. So what I want to do in the next episode is actually go ahead and start just kind of setting up the UI. So we're not going to worry. I'm, I'm just going to comment out all of these run example things because we don't need that. Uh, for the moment, uh, but we'll leave it there so we have some boilerplate stuff to give us an idea once we import our contracts. But up next, what I'm going to do is just kind of start putting in uh, some of the user interface for the bookstore. And then what we're going to do is pull in the contracts we wrote before, make sure we get all that set up right. And then once we get the contracts set up in the project, we'll obviously start trying to integrate them into the user interface. So for example, um, and also we need to integrate with ALEF, which is our decentralized database. And again, the whole point of this is to build something that we can run in a, in a very, if not entirely decent, decentralized way. So once we deploy it, it just kind of runs itself and we can like not ever have to think about it again. That would be like a really cool scenario. Um, it's, I don't know if it'll work exactly like that, but that's the idea. And then once we get our... Um, our decentralized database setup, our ALEF connection, We've got our smart contracts in there. We will work towards integrating all the different functionality of the smart contracts so that you can actually publish books. Uh, you'll be able to see the status of books, like if they're published or not. You know, once they're published, people can buy them. So you'll be able to see how many copies you have left versus how many you've sold. Um, you'll be able to see a balance of money that you've earned and all this sort of stuff. So Anyway, um, that's the gist. That's where we're going. Um, it's going to be hopefully not too long, but I suspect it's going to be a little bit of a long haul going through this. So that's kind of the point, though. I mean, I want to build out realistic projects, not just little to-do apps. I mean, those are cool. They help you get started, but I want to build stuff that's more interesting for me and for you, hopefully, that kind of helps you think about harder problems. And it probably goes a little bit slower than some people might like, but I think that's part of the process and working through some of this stuff. And I want to make sure to try to explore and explain as much as makes sense. So if you made it this far, as always, I really appreciate you watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.